think about the game as an age.
because like even under the social aspect of it of the ESG, mm -hmm. it talked about like the whole don't say gay bill, which right. doesn't even say don't say gay in the bill. Right. It has nothing to do with saying not gay. Bill. Yeah. You know, yeah. But yeah. they pointed that out. They pointed that out, right? So the part part of the project of doing this is also you know kind of helping you evaluate <clears throat> other people's writing, right? Other mm -hmm. people's research methods. And because it is an article, right, it's not necessarily considered um, all factual because part of it's opinion, right? And editorials are a lot of opinion based sometimes, right? They have a factual base, but it's someone's perspective on something, yeah. all right? And so part of it is kind of looking at the data yourself and kind of saying, okay, is this person point valid, right? It's not a matter of their, if they're right or wrong, um, is, this, is this person's point valid based on what was given to me as far as information and data and what was available? Most people never read that bill. Like any bill or something that goes to Congress, and then three, four, 500 pages long. Those guys don't read that stuff. There's stuff in there, the fine print, that they stick, that's why they call it, you know, pork belly, right? Because they stick stuff in there so they can get it through because no one's reading it, right? And exactly, and that doesn't say no gay, right? It's, it says something that affects, but how you decipher it and how you read it and perceive it is part of the process of, hey, doing your analysis, right? Yeah, okay, got it. That's what you said, but based on what I looked at in the research, this isn't what you're saying is not, come on in. What you're saying is not necessarily good. Hey, yeah. you know, or correct, or it, it, it's a stretch from what was put in the bill and what I'm reading is factual, mm -hmm. you know, black and white in the bill um, or in the legislation. So, um, but that's good. I want you to have a bright video. I mean, I did find some good stuff on the ESG topic because mm -hmm. there, there was an article that showed that people who prioritize ESG in their investing actually had more wealth. Right. So there was like good points of that. Yeah. And I kind of try to focus on that. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, yeah, work on it. See, uh, you know, see what comes out of it, and that's the whole point of having the case study and having the groups, right? So you guys can work collectively, kind of bounce it off each other, and I get a chance to read what each group perspective is on, right? And then I get to compare and contrast myself. I'm like, oh, I never thought of it that way. Like, that's a good point, or. But then I don't know that, you know, oh, you guys dug this up? I'm like, oh, okay. Right? So that's good. So you should always have a, a healthy gripe about schoolwork and academics. Um, any other, um, what you gonna call it, questions or anything like that? No? Anybody good? Okay. Um, so this week we're going to be looking at, we're going to be looking at um, ethics and AI, or ethics and technology, and uh, also privacy, right? And so with ethics and, and just technology itself, it wasn't necessarily, um, not that it wasn't a big deal. It was always a big deal about the ethics of new technology and how to employ it and, you know, how it works. But now with AI, it's even more so important that the ethics are in place, so much so that they have a separate, we have a whole separate discipline, ethics and AI. People are experts in just ethics and, and artificial intelligence because it's changed the landscape so much and its ability to be easily editable, right? Easily manipulated has caused a lot of problems, right? And as far as back as, I think when Barack Obama was running for president, right? We had all these videos over the place of him saying things that you knew it wasn't him, right? I mean, so I think one of you guys put in your in your uh in your post about deep fakes, yeah. right? And th that kind of thing, right? That is happening all the time now. Okay. The voiceovers, right? Or I can take something five seconds, literally I can have a I have an app. All I need is this little snippet of your voice and I can have you saying anything. Sounds just like you. And so the ethics surrounding that, right, don't necessarily come into play on a day-to-day -day basis, but on a larger scale, we're thinking about, you know, the election per se, right? And then being able to manipulate <clears throat> video, audio, and make it seem like someone said something when they didn't say it, right? And you see all these memes, you'll see all this stuff where they'll take, you know, 
Donald Trump's face, they'll put it someplace here. They'll take Kamala Harris' face and put it somewhere here, doing funny stuff, saying things that you know they wouldn't say, right? But the problem is that people believe that stuff, right? People bite and they, they, they go into that stuff. They think that stuff is real, not understanding that. There are unethical, even, even, even J.D. Vance, right, got to the point where he said, if I need to lie in order to, to, to show you that what's happening, I will. But it's very contradictory in the sense that if you're lying to try to prove something that you say is a lie, then you're not really proving it, right? Because you, you're trying to lie for a lie. But this is not a lie. This is the truth. You're just trying to lie so you get people to switch to your perspective, right? And so when it comes down to technology and under, and and people have a tendency to um, have so much trust in technology, right? Oh, I found it on the internet. The calculator said it was 20, right? You know two plus two is four, but people will literally put in the calculator and they'll punch something wrong and the answer will say three and they'll put three down. How is two plus two equal to three? Well, that's what the calculator said. You can't trust technology like that. You have to be thinking to yourself, like, this doesn't make sense. I did something wrong along the, you know, along the way, right? And so when it comes to technology and AR, or technology and ethics, you really got to, you know, take a step back and start who is managing and creating and developing this stuff, right? And then you kind of get to the point of, like, okay, what are their perspective what are their value what are their morals right we had that issue with um facebook and instagram when it first came out and you guys may have heard about this where it was categorizing you know how facebook has that function where if you hover over it it'll pop the name up of the person that you're hovering over that picture it'll say you know mm -hmm. if it's in the database it'll say oh, the person's name okay instagram when it first came out they had this face recognition thing going on. And when it got to black people, it 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 called them gorillas. Right? And then you're like, how does that how does that happen? Well, it's not the algorithm, it's not the program, it's the coder. It's the person that built the code. The way they trained the algorithm, they trained it to where it would identify black people as gorillas. Right? And he so and he admitted that. He admitted that he had these biases that he put into the code in order for it to do that, right? And so, again, unethical behavior, for whatever reason, he just wanted to do it, and, you know, racist or prejudice, whatever the case may be. He wanted to do that, right? And technology is evolving so fast, and we have a very uh, slow understanding of it, right? The, the layman doesn't really understand how all this technology works, right? And the fact that you can manipulate it, right? When you go to, that's why when, you know, when you're resourcing stuff and you go, you put Wikipedia down, you can't just put Wikipedia as your main resource because Wikipedia is can be manipulated, right? I can go to Wikipedia right now, I put down, I'm an NBA player, I'm 6'6", six, six, and I played in the NBA for five years and I know LeBron and I, I mean, and then if, if it's on the internet, it's true, right? Okay? It's not. Right? It's unethical to do that, right? And so when it comes to technology, a lot of companies have issue, you know, with the technology being ethical and also when it comes down to the privacy of the employee, right? Monitoring your actions. Okay. When internet first came out in the workplace, um, I remember not even the internet, like Facebook, right? And Facebook was really popular. People would go on that on their work uh computers and be looking at Facebook. Companies didn't like that because you were spending company time doing personal things, right? And guess what? They started tracking that stuff, right? Same thing in the military, in the Marine Corps specifically, we had the uh, the porn identifier, right? Because we had people at work on government computers looking at pornography. They thought they were getting away with it, but they weren't because we had a, a system in which it tracked what you were watching, right? What you were looking at on the computer, and then it had a certain algorithm that looked for and matched the pixels of, you know, body parts and that kind of thing. Things that they were forbidden on, you know, eventually you were you couldn't go on it and they were restricted, right? 
But all of these things when it comes to technology are things that, you know, we are just way behind in because technology is moving so fast and the unethical uh, actors out there, the bad actors out there, they are willing to do anything and manipulate anything in order to, you know, get your money, all right? I don't know how many phone calls you guys get or emails from the prince of whatever country who has a million dollars and he just needs you to send him a hundred thousand and he'll give you five hundred thousand dollars, right? We couldn't do that before, right? The internet email allows you to do certain things. We couldn't get people to get scammed off of crypto, right? Because we couldn't do that kind of thing, transaction, till we got the phone, right? That's you. And now people get scammed out of their money all the time because they send stuff, you know, or they're, you know, let people see their wind their their screen. And then manipulating stuff. It's it's technology has a lot a lot of bad people to make a lot of money illegally and unethically, right? Taking advantage of old people, right? Taking advantage of just children, taking advantage of just just kind of everything, right? And just altering the space in how companies really deal with you know privacy and making sure that you're doing what you need to be doing, right? And you now throw remote work on top of that, right? So, so you're at home, but on a company computer, are you allowed to look at certain things, right? Because you're home, right? But you have a government computer, or you have a, a, a organizational computer asset, right? Can it? How does that work, right? And it, it's 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 great because it's, I'm home, I'm off the clock. Why can't I use the asset? To my personal use, like well, you know, it is a it's a it's a government asset or it's a company asset. When you get done with it, we're gonna wipe it clean and give it to someone else, right? So why would you do stuff on there that we technically have legal rights to just confiscate? And that's that's kind of where it's at right now, right? If it's a organizational asset, I can come get it from you anytime I want. If I say give it up right now, you have to give it to me. What you've been browsing. Is none of my concern, right? I'm gonna look at it, and if it's something that's not will be browsed on, then you know we'll we'll deal with that later on as far as legal um, things. But you have to understand that it's not yours, even though you're home. Okay, you need to use your own computer. But technology is really throwing monkey wrench and things to the point where now it's okay if you're at work, you can surf the internet, you can look at Facebook. You know, companies have taken have bought this stuff aboard because they realized that they couldn't fight it. So let's use it as a marketing tool, right? Instagram, uh, Twitter, or X, Facebook. The, the number of ads on all these particular platforms has increased exponentially from when they first came out. There were never any commercials or ads on Facebook and that kind of thing. Over time, companies realized, like, hey, it's a good marketing tool, and I can't stop people from going on the site, okay? To the point where uh, who's watched Netflix in the past week? So what's new on Netflix? What's new? What's different on Netflix? You know on Netflix? No? Okay. What's happening on Netflix? Yeah? There's ads now. Yeah, the different tiers yeah, the different tiers. Yeah. yeah. Did they recently change that? Yeah, last week. Oh, okay. I that. I yeah, last week. Now I was watching Netflix. All of a sudden, a commercial came on. I was like, "What is going on here? Why is there a commercial?" And I was like, "Oh, they did it. They actually went to the. They switched it." And I was like, "This is ridiculous. I would. What's the point? I just might as well just stick with my cable, right? Because the whole point is for me to have commercial free." Streaming, right? But from a business standpoint, you can chess master move, right? Because now, guess what? You don't want commercial, it's going to cost you an extra dollar or two. Yeah. Yeah, right. Because every time when we watch videos here, right? Commercial comes up or some ad comes up where I got to click it in, right? So we're going to make more money off of that. Is that necessarily, you know, an ethical thing to do to your consumers? Um, no, it's legal, right? But technically speaking, if if it wasn't from a business perspective, 
um, most places would be like, that's unethical. You, you know, the whole point of, of streaming is for me to not have commercials. Now you've basically lured me in from all the years of not having commercials, and now you want to throw a commercial at me and then say, if I don't want commercials, I need to pay more money. Kind of like extortion, right? And most people are not going to pay that extra money, right? Because they're okay with the one commercial, and that, and they're smart. I see what they're doing, right? They put one commercial every 15 minutes, every 20 minutes. One, and it's a quick commercial. It's literally 10 seconds. Watch. In about a year, it's going to be two commercials. And if you have the bottom plan, it's going to be a commercial every 10 minutes, every five minutes, soon enough. It's going to force people to elevate to the next level, to 1099, I don't know what it is, right? 1099 subscription. That way you don't have any commercials, right? But it's not necessarily illegal, but when you really think about it, is that really fair to the consumer, all right? You want to make more money. And then they're gonna come after people like America who doesn't have Netflix, right? And may, you know, may never get it regardless of the point because he's like, I got other things, I got other platforms I can use, and I just don't watch Netflix like that, right? Maybe whatever the case may be, right? You're the you're the person that they want to try to get, right? But the people that they do have, in order to create a new revenue stream or more uh, profit, we have to come up with new ways in which to get it from the people, right? And so we have an existing product. But how can we segment or stratify that product into different levels, right? And they basically got the blueprint from Disney and all these other folks that came in immediately, and this is what they do, right? Disney came in, Disney Plus came in the first day. They, they had two and Hulu. They had their plans was, hey, bottom level is commercial. The next level, no commercial, right? Netflix didn't do that when they first came. Netflix was like, look, one subscription. You can have two, three people have the account, right? Now you can only have one person in the account. You want another account, you got to pay for that. You want no commercials, you got to pay for that, right? And so they they are slowly integrating it, which for them is smart, and that's why they maintain their market share because they're not losing any customers, right, off of it. They didn't just say, hey, you know, it's this or that. They're giving you options. Right, and they already have their market share, so they're like, Look, we're gonna keep our regular folks because people are not gonna jump off of Netflix because it's a commercial, right? Especially if it's spread out every 15 minutes, right? And it's 10 second commercial, they'll be fine, right? But the minute we start adding more commercials and then start to try to make it to the point where we're bumping it up to 10.99 or 11 dollars, if you want, you know, the next level, we're gonna start losing customers if that's their only choice, right. Then go ahead. We want to have the seven nine seven dollars a month ads. Mm -hmm. And then you don't want the ads and fifteen forty nine, that's only gonna be your much four K is twenty nine. Right, yeah. Yeah. So then then it depends on, you know, the quality of your T V, right? So then now you got people running out to get the four K UHD crystal Whatever you know, I saw. I went. To, I got a new TV. I got a sixty-five inch TV to put in my living room, and I was like, "What? What is UAD crystal? Is there something special that happens with the crystal? Because it was an extra thousand dollars." I was like, "I'm good. Let me just get that uh, 4K, you know, ultra high definition. Yeah, for four hundred dollars, I'm good. Okay, you can keep the sixteen hundred dollar crystal. What What does that do for me? I don't understand it, right? But it's interesting the way they have it based on your TV, right? The quality of your TV. So they are, again, assisting or helping to grow or helping to um, develop other industries, right? And this is what happens. Some of these companies, they sit down together and, and go, hey, this is what we plan on doing. How can we work together to corner the consumer? Right, because it, it, at some point you're not going to be able to watch anything on 1080. It's just not going to be enough. You're going to go to other places. You're going to see all this fine definition. You know, you're going to be able to see people's pores on some of these TVs. Right, it's, that guy look got a little dot on his nose. Like I never saw that before. Well, that's because you didn't have crystal. Now you got crystal, and you know you can see everything. Right. How can we attach what we do to what you do, right? And that helps to develop your industry at the same time, bringing more money, right? And we're innovating. 
right? We're trying to keep up with each other and trying to complement each other because those things go together. Oh, you got this TV here, you got this Netflix, you know, the next level. You need a sound bar, right? Don't you want the surround sound that go with it so you can really hear everything, right? Oh, we got this surround system, right, that goes with this. It's a whole racket, okay? Same thing with the phone, okay? Man, I think we talked about this before, okay? If you have iPhone 13 or, you know, I have a 13, this is a 13, I don't know. They have to what, 15 or 16 now, right? 15? 16, 16, right? So all the updates for 16 and 15, right, will slow this thing down to a crawl, okay? And guess what? I'm going to get frustrated. I'm like, I got to get to 16. Because updates on my pictures, I can't do nothing, right? Granted, I don't have that much stuff on there, right? But I know people that take pictures on the regular, right? You got Instagram, X, all that stuff. All those apps are running in the background, right? Eventually, all those updates are going to flood your phone. They're going to kill your processor, right? They're going to kill your memory. The only thing left for you to do is either delete stuff or go get the new one, okay? Again, not illegal, but unethical in a sense, right? Because now I'm forcing you to kind of go in this, this particular area, right? Um, and so when it comes down to tech ethics and, and privacy, it really boils down to the monitoring piece, right? Of if I have a piece of technology that, you know, and I know a lot of us think this, right? We're talking about whatever. You go on your phone, pull up Safari, pull up your web browser, boom, that particular thing pops up on your web browser, right? Because the phone's listening, right? Everybody thinks the phone's listening. And it does, and in it's in in sort of kind of way, it's listening to you, right? It's listening to, to what's being said and, and that kind of thing, right? And so am I being monitored, right? And how far does that go? Um, is it is it fair for... Uh, buildings that have cameras all over the place, right? In front of my door, in the garage, in the, in the, uh, what you might call it, um, uh, in the, uh, all the recreational rooms, at the pool, right? There's cameras everywhere, right? When you're at work, right? Do you want a camera in the bathroom? Okay. Do you want a camera right over your head? Right, you, you, there's privacy issues with that. Like there's conversations I'm, I need to have. Right, this is not a police station. We're not in, you know, we're in a company that makes bicycles or something. I, I don't need a camera everywhere, right, and tracking me. This is why one of the issues that one of the new technologies it's been around for five five years now, right? And it's basically uh, it's a grain of rice this size, it's chip this size. And they're testing it out in Sweden and Ohio and some other places. They basically insert it into your your body. And then on it is a read-only barcode that opens your car, has your banking information in it, opens the door to your office, that kind of thing. No need for keys, no need for wallets, no need for anything. Everything is on this barcode, right? And what it is, and it's based on proximity, uh, side uh, line, uh, side of line uh, type technology. So unless you're near a scanner or something, it won't work, all right? So now the question is, if I give you one of these chips as a new employee, right, where does the monitoring stop? When I leave the office, are you guys still monitoring me that I went to the alcohol store and I went to the, the liquor store and got a little drink? Are you guys monitoring me if I went to the strip club, right? That's the way I detox or decompress. Are you guys monitoring me if I went to the library, right? When I go to the bathroom at home, when you guys monitoring me, right? So that is a question as far as the privacy rights when it comes down to technology and understanding, okay, what is the, the limit? What are the parameters that are going to be set for Big Brother, right? You guys remember um, uh, that movie, Minority, Minority Report? No? Tom Cruise. So basically, the movie's premise is that Tom Cruise is a police officer, and they have this technology that can predict future crimes. And so they can see the crime happening, and what they do is they go and they arrest the person before the crime even happens. 
But in a sense, it's somewhat, it's legal, but it's unethical because if the person didn't do the crime, what are you arresting them for? You're arresting them for future things that not are not going to happen now, right? And so there's a dilemma there where can I set somebody up that way where it's like, oh, I saw that you will commit a crime, so we're going to arrest you now. But I didn't do anything. What if I changed my mind, right? Even though the screen, the computer says, oh, this crime is going to happen, I'm human. I can change my mind all the way up to the point of execution, all right? Who's to say that that wouldn't happen, right? Who's to say that this particular algorithm, this computer, you know, is so advanced and so smart that that I cannot exert my free will to make a decision to change my course of action, right? And so he goes through this dilemma where something happens and he gets popped up on the screen where he's committing a future crime, murder, something like that, right? But there's no context to it. That's the problem. There's no context to the. When you see it on the screen, you really don't know what's happening, right? You just see two guys in the street fighting. It doesn't tell you if one guy provoked another. It doesn't tell you if the guy he stabbed him first. You know, it doesn't say all that. It just shows the crime, and that's it, right? And all these crimes, they kind of disparate information, and they try to put them together, but you have to have the skill, the art to put it together to figure out, okay, what is kind of crime is it? Is this a crime that, you know, is connected to another crime? It's always a whole bunch of stuff, right? But the technology itself, um, it becomes... Uh, bad because the people that are managing it are using it in an unethical way. Now they're trying to make money off of it. So now they're framing people. Oh, you're going to commit this crime in next week. If you don't want me to come get you, right, and then I delete this, right, because you can always change your mind, we need a million dollars. Okay, or we need this, or we're going to blackmail you, or we're going to do this or that, right? And so, the movie evolves, Tom Cruise gets caught up in it and that kind of thing. And he finds out that they're manipulating the system to set people up and they set him up because they want to get rid of him because he was um he would he figured out anything he saw a crime that was done by a high profile person that they didn't want arrested, right? And so not knowing the context, he basically was like, I'm gonna go get this dude. And they're like, nah, don't touch him. You leave him alone. And he's like, whatever. And then they set him up, right? And so there's all these situations where you have that occurring, you have privacy issues occurring, right? And understand, okay, what are the, the ethical considerations for the workplace, right? When it comes to people and the technology and their privacy, right? If I have a camera on my, on my uh, computer, right? Should the camera be on and monitoring me all the time, right? There's jobs like that where the camera's on 24 seven, right? The police officers now, right? They have to wear the body cam. Okay. When can I turn this thing off? And when can I turn it on? It doesn't have to be on all the time. If I'm on duty, it doesn't have to be on all the time. And we see cases already where cops turn it off when they don't when they want to turn it off, they'll turn it off. Right? And you don't know what happened and they turn it back on and you see a situation occurring, but you have no real context because it's been off for the last 10 minutes and all of a sudden it comes back on and you got somebody in handcuffs and you're beating them talking about self-defense. Right or other way around, right? You can't prove that what was going on was actually going on because you turn the camera off, or you know it's been used for good stuff. Or the knucklehead police officer was a couple months ago. He uh, so he had his he had his his body his patrol cam on in the in the vehicle, and he picked up a prostitute. You guys heard about this? He picked up a prostitute. And of course, you know, I'm sure in a, on a day-to-day -day basis, you pick up a prostitute, you pick up people, they try to say, no, if you, come on in. Hey, if you let me go, I'll do some favors for you. So that's what she proposed to him. So he, you know, he drove off somewhere. You know, he thought it was, you know, isolated and secluded. He gets in the back seat. She does the rope or dope on him. Guess what? Door closes. He's stuck back there with her. Because, you know, you can't, once you're in the back, you can't get out. You have, someone has to let you out from the outside. When you're inside, there's no way to get out. He had to call back to the station and say, hey, I need somebody to come let me out the back of the, the vehicle. Of course, that raised all kind of questions. Like, what are you doing? Like, why were you in the back of the vehicle? Like, what, what, what was going on? She just sucked at you. She had handcuffs on. How, 
how'd you get stuck back there? Right? And so he made up this whole story, but he forgot his his car cam was on. And so he caught the whole thing on tape. And now he's off the force and they're about to, you know, uh whatever, send him to jail or prison, whatever he's gonna do. They probably let him go on probation or whatever, because it's just boneheaded stuff, right? But again, unethical behavior, right, by a police officer, someone that we put trust and faith in, right, to to follow the law to to uh, be the enforcer or the uh, execute the law, right? And he took advantage of that situation and got caught and made a stupid mistake. And she got, you know, she walked away, whatever, minding her business. Cause she's like, look, I offered it. He said, yeah. And he just, you know, messed around and, and got caught, right? And so it's always that question of who is using it and how they use it, right? How is the technology being used, but more or less, more so who's managing it and what how is it constructed that's why it's important to figure out who these developers are when we come to ai mm-hmm. and algorithms and why they do certain things and um that's why face recognition is such a big deal because the technology is great if it's done the right way but it's been used in many cases in which to indict or to convict innocent people because a lot of times they have very similar facial features to people, right? But even in the sense that an eyewitness account, right, um, is not as credible as the computer, and not, not as credible as face recognition. If you do any real study about case law when it comes to eyewitness accounts, eyewitness accounts are usually pretty useless unless it's like you, you have to be like a certain amount of time distance, all this stuff. Because most violence accounts, people, when they're in the moment, they think they're looking at somebody, they think they're identifying certain things, but they're really not. And when you line up all the people, they identify the wrong person, right? Eyewitness accounts are not very reliable, right? Again, an unethical, you know, decision or unethical situation where someone is stuck in a dilemma where you go to the police station, you say, hey, this person committed the crime, And it wasn't them. But instead of just saying, like, I'm not sure, I don't know, the pressure causes them to say, yes, that's the person, when it wasn't the person, right? There's a case, I don't even know if it's still going on, but um, let's see, wait a minute. Either way, this this guy got uh, put to death last week. I don't know if you guys saw that, right? He got put to death. But they had said that um, the person who actually did it or said he did it, Um, he confessed, right? But they didn't believe him. They're like, we don't don't go for that, because I'm sure that happens all the time, right? Somebody's going to die, somebody's in prison for life, and then somebody else might get a chance to get out. Man, just take this rap from me. You're not going anywhere, okay? They might make up the lie, but all the eyewitnesses that that convicted this this person, when you go back and you talk to them, they're like, you know, I wasn't really sure. I'm not positive, like... It could have been him, but, you know, that moment I thought it was him for sure, but then now that I think about it, it was, you know, a lot of things were going on, right? That's the kind of answer you get. But then with the technology, right, and saying that, um, you know, we saw more video and all that kind of thing, the video was super grainy, and, but they took that and the eyewitness account and put it together and convicted this person, right? And the person ended up, you know, getting executed last week, right? The government didn't give him a stay of execution, so they end up dying, but they the whole time he's been saying like he didn't do it, he didn't do it, he didn't do it, right? And that happens a lot in the prison system, in the in the legal system, especially now with the technology, because people will believe the technology if they see the person's face and the computer affirms what they think they see, right? They're gonna go ahead and say that's that person. I've been like uh, uh, not accused, but mistaken. Right? I had this old lady at, at Disney. I was there one year. And she came to me and she was talking to me like I was her grandson. And I said, I'm not your grandson. She's like, yeah, you are. Da, da, da. I'm like, I'm not your grandson. And I thought maybe she was senile or something like that. And then the rest of her family came and was like, he looks exactly like him. Like you guys could be brothers. Right? And I'm like, well, it ain't me. Right? And so, um, yeah, so 
you know, it's easy to go ahead and, and, and take technology and rely upon it too much, right? And then not really do your due diligence and not use common sense and saying, okay, we have to have different things to verify this, right? This is why fingerprints, right? You gotta have 12 points, right? When it comes to, you know, face recognition, there has to be 10, 15, 20, 30, 100 different points of similarity in order for it to be really like, okay, good to go, right? That's why they don't, you can't use certain technology in the court of law because it's not reliable, okay? And so when you have the companies kind of dealing with, you know, um, monitoring new technology, right? And then not really understanding who they have working for them, right? You get into these unethical dilemmas where people start manipulating things um, in their favor and doing things that, you know, are not, they're not legal and they're not right. Okay. They're not, they're not, they, they mistreat people. They put people in a different, in a bad light, in a bad spot, right? Because once that happens, it's almost impossible to fix your reputation once you get on the internet for being a certain thing or they see, people see a certain, uh, uh, video, right? Like, so for instance, Let's talk about uh Mr. Uh, Puff Daddy, right? Sean Combs, right? He denied the whole time that he had assaulted that that woman, that Cassie, his his girlfriend for ten years, right? No, I didn't do. I never touched her. So the video came out of her of him beating her, throwing faces at her, like kicking her, like it was right there. You you could see playing the day it was him, right? If that video wasn't around, if that technology wasn't available. There was it was just a he say she say type thing, right? He would have be he'd be free right now, right? Or he he'd be twenty five million dollars richer, I should say. Okay, but now he's in prison, right? Because people saw the video and realized that he had lied. But the only reason that they could prove it because they had the technology, right, to back up what they thought was going on, right? Granted, it's only one piece, right? And they have other videos and stuff like that. Now I guess that you know they're using for his uh. I think his new 125 new cases against him. Just today, yeah, like 120 today. 20. I saw a new case. Yeah. That doesn't include the old one. No, it doesn't include the old one, right? 120 new cases, right? Which, and there's a lot of high profile people involved, da, 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 right? All technology, right? This is sometimes you'll go to certain venues and then they will confiscate your phone or they will say, they'll give you, you guys have been to a concert where they give you plastic bags? And tell you put your phone in the plastic bag, right? Because you can't take videos, you can't take pictures because there's people out there that are taking the videos and they're posting them on YouTube and they're selling them, right? They're bootlegging them, right? Just like bootleg movies, you know, you see them sometimes. You buy them on the street and you see somebody get up talking, right? It's the movie, but that's somebody in the movie theater literally recording the video, right? And they're selling it. Okay, technology is it's it's a beautiful thing. It's it's amazing, but we also have to keep in mind that there are bad actors out there who are willing to you know take the technology, manipulate it in the way that they want to manipulate it, um, and give you false narratives. Okay, that's really what it boils down to: giving you fake information, giving you information that's not factual or credible, in order to change or persuade you to do something, to make a decision about something, to See it their way when that's not what really happened, okay? That's not what really happened. So, um, all things that company you know strive for, right? All right. So, um. Privacy is surprisingly vague in this uh, discrete value, okay? Calls for greater protection of privacy rights increase with increased use of computers. Widespread confusion on the nature, extent, and value of privacy, right? So, again, going back to privacy in the workplace, right? And what are the, the limits on what I can do when it comes to monitoring the employee? Is it strictly when on the computer? Can I turn the camera on? Am I monitoring them when they go to the bathroom? Am I tracking their every movement? 
of going to the cafeteria, going to wherever, going to their car, going on smoke breaks, right? Because there are some companies where they they're watching you, right? And if you go on too many smoke breaks, a three three was a Toyota, you could go on three smoke breaks during your eight hour period, okay? And there were fifteen minutes each. That's a lot of time. Right, if you really think about it from a organizational standpoint, where I'm giving you 45 minutes in a day, in an eight-hour day, I'm giving you 45 minutes in addition to your lunch to go smoke. Right, that's a lot of money. And so, if you went over that, right, they would bring you in, right. But it wasn't necessarily a system that was tracking it; it was just the the fact that your boss would would be keeping an eye on you or whatever the case may be. But now they have technology; they have the cameras in there. And they're watching because there's designated smoke areas, right? You just can't smoke anywhere you want, so you go designate smoke areas, and they're watching how many times you come to the smoke area, and then they're reporting that back to your boss, saying, "Hey, John came to smoke area five times today at ten minutes a pop. Now you're fifty minutes, buddy. Okay, too many smoke breaks. I'm gonna need you to curb that to three. All right, the rule of three, fifteen minutes each. All right, you go out there socializing. I get it." It's kind of like the water cooler thing, right? But are you already taking a smoke break? When you get back to your computer, you're surfing the net, right? Then you're going to lunch. So, you you know, how many hours of work am I really getting out of you, right? On average, people work about four hours a day, like real work, out of eight-hour day, okay? The rest of the time, you're doing everything else. You're going to the bathroom, you're eating, you're talking, you're drinking your coffee, you, you, you just doing whatever you want, okay? And so companies see that as a waste of money, right? They want to make sure that, um, you know, that they're not getting taken advantage of by letting you be too free with the time, okay? All right, uh, privacy is right. It's the right to be left alone within a personal zone of solitude. And privacy is the right to control information about oneself, okay? So there is a sense of, hey, I have a certain level of autonomy or a certain level of privacy or lonely time I should have, right? I shouldn't have someone in my space 24-7, even when I'm alone, right? And there's also the notion of, hey, whatever is out there about me, right, it should be private. I should have control over that, okay? But we don't, right? Because if you go out in here in the street and somebody decides they want to take a picture of you, there's nothing you can do about that. Okay, it's, it's you're in public domain, so you, there's problems with that. So is the workplace a public domain, and where you know the employer can take pictures of you anytime they want, videos of you anytime they want, right? Audio of you anytime they want, and the answer yes. Okay, you're in that building, you're there for a certain purpose. They compensate you for that purpose. They can monitor you because technically you should not be doing anything that's outside the purview of your work responsibility. Right, you should be should be no big deal. Why 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 should you be worried about you know me monitoring you if you're doing the right thing? Okay, if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, there's no problems, right? But at the same time, there's some I, I have to be able to have some boundaries, right? And where I feel that I'm on my own, where I'm not being monitored and watched on a regular basis because that will make me uncomfortable. That's a lot of pressure to think that someone's always watching me. This is not prison. Right, people don't. Even, I don't think people get watched in prison as much as they do in the workplace. Because once you get into your cell, for the most part, there's no cameras in your cells in prison. For the most part, it's outside the general areas, common areas, that kind of thing. But in the cell, very few prisons have uh, cameras, except for mass security. I think where they kind of watch it or a suicide watch and that kind of thing. Even then, it's a, an actual person. Right. So when it comes down to the workplace, though. The right to be left alone is too broad and not feasible in the workplace, right? Because you really can't control that, right? You can't control that right to be left alone, right? That personal zone. There's only so much you can do. If you're in a cubicle and there's a cubicle next to you, right? And you have a personal conversation you're having, that person's going to hear everything you got to say, right? It's up to you to decide, do I want to have this conversation in here? Or should I go outside or go to my car? To have this conversation, right? If you have the conversation within the building, then you are saying it's okay to be monitored, okay? I was, uh, when Nathan first got here, I was on the phone, all right? I was talking to someone. 
that conversation I was having here, okay, you know, it was on my break, right? It was a break between classes, but if the school wanted to and they felt like something was inappropriate, they'd be like, hey, that conversation we had was inappropriate and, you know, don't do that on school property or whatever the case may be. Go outside or whatever you were talking about, right? If that's not, we don't, we don't want you to do that or we're monitoring that, okay? What does that have to do with school, right? My personal conversation, me talking about something with someone on the phone, just because I happen to be inside the building, right? Um, it's still my private conversation, but it's not, right? Because I'm inside the school, I'm using somewhat using school assets, right? I'm using the, uh, maybe using the Wi-Fi, but probably not, okay? But I'm here at the school, and at any time, a student can come in, which is their right to come into the classroom. So my conversation, my privacy should not supersede the student's rights to come into the classroom, right? And so you have all this kind of stuff that goes on in the workplace where, oh, you know, behind closed doors or in my cubicle or, you know, if I'm sitting in my computer um, or even better yet, right? Anybody ever, um, anybody know how UPS works? The UPS drivers? I know they monitor it. They monitor from, like from crazy. Stop to stop, they have a certain amount of time. I know they're highly Yes, monitored. they're highly monitored. The UPS guy has a certain amount of time from when he leaves the truck, delivers the package to when they get back. It's, they got it down to a sign. You have three minutes. You check out the truck, boom, you come back in. If you're not back in three minutes, boom, it starts to dock. Yeah, it starts It starts running the clock. And you're five minutes behind. And every the amount of time that you're behind, guess what? They take it out your pay. Right? That's why these guys are so efficient. Because they find a way in which to leverage that and say, look, you need to be on time. If it's three minutes to deliver a package, that's what you do. You deliver three minutes. But what that translates into is to poor customer service at times, right? Where you have Amazon or UPS drivers, they have this time crunch that they're trying to beat. But what if they can't find the apartment? What if this, this address isn't correct? What if, you know, they can't get into the building, right? And it's taking them five minutes. It's not their fault. So now you're docking them, right? And so what, you, you know, what ends up happening? They just drop the package right there. Delivered. <laughs> Where's it at? In front of your building. I had that happen to me. I ordered Uber Eats once. And the dude literally left the food in front of the building because he couldn't get in. And he didn't call me. I would have buzzed him in. He couldn't get in. He left the food in front of the plant that's in front of the front door. What do you think happened to my food? It was gone within 30 seconds. The homeless, some homeless person came and snatched it up and had a great meal. Okay, it was some Thai food I had got. Okay, it was after work. You know, I was like, I'm not cooking tonight. I didn't take anything out, so I'm gonna order something. I was starving, and the food was gone. So I called him up like, "Hey, where's my food? Oh, it was dropped off. Dropped off where? It says front door. Front door. I don't have. I just I just opened my door. I don't see any food. No, the front door of the building." I like what kind of stupid asinine delivery driver you had to leave a front to leave the food in the front of a front door in a public street with homeless people everywhere, right? It doesn't make any sense to me. It's because they got a time, you know. They have to. I got a. I got a certain amount of time. I can't be goofing around with you, all right? If I can't get into your building, I'm dropping this off right here, and that's just the way it is. And I'm going to say delivered, right? And so when you look at that, right, and this is why Amazon instituted that policy they have, right? I think the Nathan was did you look it up how much Amazon loses? It's like billions. billions, right? Because what was happening is that people the delivery guy would drop the package off, but then you see those guys, they'll come to the porch, they'll pick the package up and run off with it. Okay. And then now you the consumer who pays for a package, and Amazon has done what they're supposed to do contractually, right? But they were getting complaints about, hey, look, the package isn't there, right? And so Amazon instituted the whole, hey, picture thing, right? So now when they deliver it, they take a picture and they send it to you. Things over 100 now, they have a code now. They have a code now, right? And so, and the other thing they did was, okay, we're not going to, excuse me, 
argue with the customer. If the customer said they didn't receive the package, we're going to honor that and we will just eat it. Okay, we make enough money. It's better to maintain a customer relationship because the customer is a recurring customer and they're going to keep buying stuff from me. But if I don't take care of this for them, they're not going to come back to Amazon, right? They'd rather go someplace else. They'd rather get me to store physically and go get whatever they need to get than order it to Amazon, right? Because they know that if the package comes up missing and it's not their fault, that we're not going to do anything about it, right? Granted, it's part of the business, okay? And so it costs companies a lot of money, but they have these take these policies or these initiatives in place in order to try to make sure that the customer is happy. And then on the back end, they'll do the best they can to do the research and try to figure out okay if they can figure it, you know, who took it, why. And most time it's not even worth it, right, for them. So it's like, eh, okay, we'll send another one out. It's gonna cost us six billion, but guess what? We made twelve billion you know, just on this thing. So we'll, you know, it's, it's a wash somewhere along the line, right? They they figure it out, right? Same thing when you have your bank account hacked into, right? And something happens and, and, and your money's gone out of your bank account, right? Some some uh, some hacker gets in there. The bank automatically deposits the money back, right? They'll say, okay, fine, no problem. $5,000 got taken out and it wasn't you. They put 5000 well, maybe Fed does anyway. They'll put the money back in there. And what they do is we're going to do an, an investigation because they can, because the way of the system, the system works, right? They know exactly all the transactions. There's a ledger. I know which bank it went to, who took what out of the ATM. You know, when you go to ATM, you know, there's the cameras and all that stuff, right? And the bank has a system in where they can track every transaction, right? There's a, there's a number to it. And so they do an investigation and they see, okay, was this a fraudulent claim, right? Were you in on it, right? Or was it something that you honestly got hacked, right? If it was something you honestly got hacked and someone took your money, they let you keep the money, right? They reimburse you and you get your money, you whole, and they just eat it, right? But for something where they find out that you were in on it or you were careless in some way where you gave away your pin or you did something stupid like that, they take the money right back. They'll snap it right out of that account. Right, you think you're gonna transfer it? Cool, you can try to transfer it. They will contact the other bank wherever you transferred it to, unless you take it out in cash. They will contact the other bank because it's intra bank and they'll get that money out. Okay, so the technology is great in the sense that you know, for the banking system or the financial system, it was we can track the transaction, but for Amazon and other companies that do that deliver goods or deliver products, goods, or services, it, it, it's a little bit harder, right? And they have to kind of eat that stuff, and they try to mitigate the cost of those things as best they can by having these monitoring systems, by implementing, you know, uh, surveillance, right? By, you know, putting in, uh, one, one thing I, I didn't realize that companies are doing now, like I said, I, I moved, I bought a sofa sleeper, and I put in the den, and as soon as I got the sofa sleeper, kept getting this thing on the phone saying, you know, air tags, air tags, air tags are present. I'm like, I don't have any air tags. I don't, I, I never bought them. I don't, I, I just moved in. No, there's no air tags to be seen, right? I don't, I'm like, where's air tags at? The air tags were in the couch, in the sleeper sofa. Because they're trying to track, make sure it gets to where it's supposed to get to, right? Because if you guys know anything about logistics and distribution and messing around with, with freight and, the, you know, in goods, products, and services, things tend to disappear, okay? Um, they end up on the black market, cars disappear. Uh, I don't tell you guys about the other thing, but the air tags were in the sofa. And I was like, why would you put air tags in there? Like, well, we're tracking it to make sure it gets to the end customer. I was like, well, you might want to tell the customer that because I keep getting these notifications and it's driving me crazy about air tags and I don't have air tags, right? And so I found the air tag and I was like, this is cool, sort of, right? But it's not because I don't know. And then now you're tracking me, basically, right? So because every time that I come near the air tags, it pings the phone that it's tagging to. So now you know my location based on these air tags. That's a violation of my privacy, right? Because that's not your business to know where I'm at. But because you have these air tags in the couch, 
you know that I'm here, right? Or at least the phone is there, right? And so that's the whole thing. And they had this uh, they had this situation. It might have been on the video we watched last week, um, where this guy he has his truck parked in front of his house. He just bought it probably a week or two ago. Sixty thousand dollar truck. He put an air tag in it, right? And so one day, one night, he goes to bed. He comes out. The truck gets stolen. He goes on the internet, you know, wherever they, they, you know, have the status of the tag. And he's tracking his car the whole time. His car goes from uh, Florida to Massachusetts to Europe to Russia into Serbia somewhere. He contacts all these authorities to tell him, hey, I know exactly. Like, they can see the car. They go, he gets a private investigator. The VIN, everything. Guess what? We can't get the car back. What do you mean you can't get the car back? Technically, it's against the law for us to take it. Like, what do you mean it's my car? Yes, we know. It's your air tag, the VIN numbers match, everything. But it's in Siberia. I mean, technically, like, you really can't do anything about it. Like, he gets somebody in Siberia to go verify the car. He, and they send him pictures, videos, like, yep, we found it. Well, can you bring it back? Well, not really. It's being sold to somebody else. Like, okay, what's the point of having the technology, right? So he's upset, and nobody could do anything for him. So basically, he's out $50,000 and no truck. Okay? And so there's issues with the whole ethical understanding of the technology, right? It's great technology, but if you really can't act on it appropriately, right, then what's the point of it all, right? If if the criminals, even if they know that there were air tags in it, right, they're doing, they're going about their business, but the technology is useless if I can't take action on it, right? You're monitoring this piece of equipment that belongs to me, that got taken, that got stolen from in front of my house, and you're saying that you can't go get it for me, even though you know I'm the legal owner of it, right? And I'm not talking about this in Siberia. It was in Massachusetts for a while, right? And they moved it to Europe. Then they moved to Eastern Europe, right? And you still couldn't get to it, right? And so, again, you know, the technology and, and understanding the ethical standards that go with that is really about the people that are managing the system, the people that are producing and developing the code, people that are producing the technology itself and how they're using it, right? In order to, you know, do whatever it is they need to manipulate the situation, you know, persuade people in their own, you know, way. Um, just just keep an eye on people, right? And there's a lot of surveillance that goes on, right? Um, for those of us that were in the military, depending on what level you're at, you understand there's high levels of, of surveillance and technology that can be used for monitoring and just, you know, recon and all that other stuff, right? I was amazed at the stuff that the Navy SEALs have, right? We had one guy, uh, he got uh, in trouble because he used some of the equipment to eavesdrop on his wife who was cheating on him. And, you know, we had some serious stuff that behind that you got to sign for and behind cages. It's super high tech sonar and, and you know all kind of listening devices all right that i didn't know we had and this guy gets the captain's mask you know goes in jp for it because he used it for personal use all right it worked real well right but at the same time you know you have to understand who's using it why they're using it and all the you know the, the ramifications the consequences that go with relying on technology right not Questioning technology, right? Because just because it's technology doesn't make it right, right? It goes go back to garbage in, garbage out. It doesn't matter that the technology can process this, right? In, in split second, if you're putting trash in, you all you're doing is processing trash faster. That's it, okay? So you have to understand, like, okay, what is this being used for? How is it being used, right? And the people that are creating it. What are their values? What is their background? What are their thoughts with their ideologies, right? Because they will put stuff in there 
that you wouldn't even imagine, right? Developers, coders, there's plenty of time and space. But there's, there's, there's times where I'm coding and I'm like, oh, I could put this in here, right? It's not a necessity, it's a preference. I like it this way, right? Or I wanted this, I wanted it to do this, right? Um, and nobody will find that code until something happens, right? And then you have to go through millions of lines of code to try to figure out what exactly happened and why did you, you know, let's say do that, right? Why, why are you monitoring me? Why you um, make it do a certain thing? Um, just because it lines up with your ideals, it lines up with your values, lines up with the things that you think it should be, right? Going back to the whole uh, uh, Instagram or, you know, um, whatever platform it was where I identified black people as gorillas, right? He just had a he had a gripe. He was he was racist. He just did not you know when he came up. That's what he wanted people to see. So he trained it that way, right? When we train algorithm, we train them supervised or unsupervised, right? And you train supervised, that means you're showing it the picture, and then you're associating black people or African Americans with that picture. In the computer, the algorithm that's how it learns. And so now it starts to identify certain things about the picture. And it automatically locks in the African American. So now, when African American pops up, a picture of the gorilla is gonna come up because that's what that's how you trained it, right? It has nothing to do with the algorithm being evil, right? Or it taking over or being able to think. It, it can't think, right? It does what it, you tell it to do. Okay. All right. Um, it's thirty-five. Let's quick take a quick ten minutes, and then come back, and then. We'll uh, wrap it up.
Uh, probably like 10 or 15. A couple of different points and then get out of here. I was laughing. It wasn't because of your phone call. It was because of like an incident that happened. It was the first time me and Mecca had a class together with Dr. Uh, Sharon. Mm -hmm. It was like the second week, and one of his graduate students came in. It was a girl, and it, it seemed like it was like a boo thing kind of thing. He put us on break at. He put us on break at six fifty, I think. Mm -hmm. At 7.45, I walked out of the class because I was like, where the fuck is this guy? Or he never came back? And then when I was leaving, I could hear him and the girl like, it sounded like they were like dabbing it up. Like, like flirting and stuff. Huh. Like, like 50 minutes. I was texting my wife the whole time. I'm like, like, it's been 30 minutes. Okay, it's been 50 minutes. I'm getting out of here. He left? Like 50 minutes. Jason Mariah is going to start going to the class after all you. You have to leave. I said that loud. I was like, fuck this. I'm leaving. It was like 50 minutes. Yeah, it was yeah. Uh, that's crazy. That's why I was laughing. It wasn't. It wasn't your phone call. It was. It was that one. It reminded me of that. That that doesn't make any sense. That's not good. Hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I never mentioned it to the staff or anything. Huh. Yeah. Not really that type of person. Yeah, I mean, whatever it is, it could have waited. Or yeah. he could have at least came back and said, look, uh, you guys are free to go. Yeah. You know, instead of you guys to sit here and just, uh, maybe he thought it was going to go a little quicker than he anticipated. Boy, I don't know. Yeah, that was the craziest class. And then they put me in a group. And this one girl, she was like, she was literally following me at like five minutes. <laughs> and then I, I requested to leave the group because it's like, okay, this didn't do much. <laughs> and then, uh, and then like whenever she sent me her work, it was all everything was directly copy pasted from shit. Because I, I I copied it and I'm like, this this looks a little too good. And then I like paste it in Google and just get yeah, like every word by word. Yeah. So I requested to get out of the group, and then there she is like calling me multiple times, multiple days in a row at five in the morning. And my wife's like, why is this girl calling me? And I had to get for Polly involved in everything. Really? I was like, like, yeah. It was was like, she local? Who? The girl. No, it was one of the students. No, I'm saying, but was she local or was she someplace else? Because a lot of the students, they're not here. 
They're physically they're, they're, No, she was a hybrid. She was in the class. Okay, she was she in the class. Okay. The... Yeah, why five in the morning? Yeah, I don't know. Well, I'm I'm just assuming that like like a lot of like you guys you probably stay up late, don't you? Sit back at home. Yeah. Okay. That's what I figured. Oh, okay, okay. Because of the time difference. Yeah, That's yeah. That's what I was assuming. It was probably her night time. Yeah, but why would she? Well, she was trying to figure out why I left the group. No, I'm saying, but why, if she's here, it's one thing to call back home. But if we're here, you know, it's 5 o'clock in the morning, you know I'm not going to be up. Yeah. Right? So the rational thing to do is to wait till like 9, 10 maybe. Yeah. And then make, you know, call home and do your thing. But call me at a decent hour. Not and then I got the assistant dean was calling me involved and then I had to like basically send her like a cease and desist like, like hey you need to stop that there. it got to that level that's crazy huh that class was just something else don't play the ride that's all okay let's get this thing going all right um so the door please um I think um uh, I better come in um all right so everybody is restricted by a boundary of reciprocal obligation, right? When an individual expects respect for their personal autonomy, that reciprocal obligation to respect the autonomy of others, right? And so this concept here is basically talking about, hey, if you want someone to respect you, you have to give them respect in, in response, right? You can't expect someone to um, understand what you're saying, respect what you're saying, but then you won't listen to them, what they're saying and you won't respect them, right? So there's reciprocal autonomy. So when it comes down to companies, employees say the same thing, like, I need you to respect my space just as much as I'm respecting your space, right? We have an understanding about that and, and, and things will go a lot smoother, you know, if we have this, this mutual respect about our privacy, our space, because I... I don't want you in my private space. I don't want you in my private time. I understand being at work, right? But when I'm at work, I will comport myself in a way that is not violating any issues for the company, and I don't want you violating my privacy, right? And that's kind of where you gotta come with that. Where if you don't want them monitoring you, right? Or if they do monitor you, you don't want to get into any issues. Don't do anything that is outside your normal parameters of, hey, professionalism, right? Understanding, I'm at work, I'm using a, a work asset. Yes, is this a personal issue? Sure, but there's, there's a limit to what I can do. I can surf the net, you know, let you surf the net for airplane tickets and stuff, you know, like that. But if it's something more than that, then you probably don't want to, you know, um, indulge in that at work because it's within their rights to monitor that stuff, right? And to keep an eye on you because it may impact, um, you know, um, the work that you're doing, right? All right, um, hyper norms, right? Values that are fundamental across culture and theory, right? Um, those values are, are determined within the normal free space and are not hyper norms. And then privacy is at the core of many of these hyper norms, right? And so hyper norms are just basically the things that, um, are universal sort of right um when we talk about not committing murder not hurting anybody right not um being respectful of others these all these notions are all universal right everybody wants to be respected everybody wants to be you know not admired per se but everybody kind of wants to be left alone sort of to let them do their thing as long as it doesn't impact you then you should not be worried about what i'm doing okay um, but at the same time, you know, although we have these, these norms, right, um, that are universally accepted, we still have these other things that, you know, kind of skirt those things or 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 are um, gray areas for these things, right? Yes. Is it uh, a norm that you don't um, kill anybody? Sure, right? But in the context of defending yourself, that's acceptable, right? I'm going to, it was me or him. Okay, or in a concept, a context of you know the domestic violence, you know the wife ends up shooting the husband, killing him, killing him, right? Well, why? Well, he was beating on me, and I was trying to save my life, right? I was trying to protect my family, so I ended up having to get rid of him, right? Did I want to do that? No, but again, it violated the type of norms, but at the same time, we could understand why, 
right? Is it uh, is it is illegal, right? But if you think from an ethical standpoint, like okay, it's ethical to, for me to decide like I'm not going to convict this lady, right? Because I know the circumstance, I know the context, I know the law, I know what she did in an absolute value kind of way is illegal and wrong, but I also have to look at the context and understand, okay, does that justify her action, right? What she been through, what he was doing to her, is that okay, right? And so, you know, when you look at hyper norms and how they um, translate globally or universally, right? They're a little different for everybody, right? Because then different things are interjected. Religion is interjected. Politics are interjected, right? You have to, and they look through those, that lens at those norms, okay? You go to the, you know, certain parts of Africa, certain parts of the Middle East, right? If your wife cheats on you, it's okay to kill her, okay? It's all right. If, you know, if you're a blasphemous, right? It's okay to be stoned. Right, if you're a thief, it's okay to get your arm chopped off in certain places, right? Um, and that's 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 but that's a norm, right? That's a for them, it's not a hyper norm, but it's a norm, right? And so, in that context, nothing's going to happen to that person that did the action, if you chop somebody's arm off, or she happens to die, right? Uh, or you kill your wife, or whatever the case may be, nothing's going to happen, right? But here in the United States, for the most part, that doesn't fly. Right, that, that's, that's not gonna work. All right, because she cheated on you. That's not enough for you to say you're gonna kill them. Right, because the lens we're looking at is very is more secular, or it's more like you know of a pragmatic and just like hey, on on a just a a, a level of humanity and being humane and just abiding by you know protecting someone's life. You can't do that for such a you know not a it's a, it's a the violation of trust, but it doesn't warrant death in our perspective, right? But it warrants death in other perspectives based on the lens viewed through a religious aspect, right? So you have to kind of look at those things and say, okay, how do we really deal with those things, right? Human rights issues are one of those areas where it's super great for a lot of countries, right? We have a lot of human rights uh, sanctions and stuff like that against North Korea, against uh, Saudi Arabia, against a lot of countries, right? But nonetheless, we still do business with them, all right? Because there's certain things where um, the, we can't stop because you have unethical behavior for us, but for you, it's okay. It's ethical, right? Because of where you're coming from or where the, the the foundation that you're using or the justification you're using is an ethical one. So that may be cool for you, but it's not cool for us. But we're still going to do business because we have other things that supersede that particular aspect of our society, right? And so we need to get rights. We need to get product. We need to, you know, other people need to live their lives. So, yeah, we're going to overlook the, the sweatshop, you know, that Nike has, right? Because guess what? It's creating a millions in a job. It's producing a billion dollars in, in revenue, right? It's the market's growing, everybody's making money, right? So you have all these things, other things um, that kind of skew the ethical lens of people and kind of make them, you know, kind of um, look at the norms and say, yes, we know what it is, but in light of the situation, we're going to bend them a little bit, right? Just like JD Vance said, hey, if I need to lie to get you to see the truth, as I see it, then I'm gonna do that, right? But you're lying about a lie, right? And so it, it doesn't make sense all the time, right? But these are norms, and the norms, you know, depending on where you're at, they change, even in middle America, right? East Coast, West Coast, Midwest, the norms are different, right? And what we see as ethical, unethical, sometimes is not, right? We don't agree. Even within our own culture, we don't agree sometimes on what we consider to be ethical and unethical behavior to be considered, you know, in in Korea, in China, they don't have privacy issues at work, okay? Because guess what? I can watch you anytime I want. You're on my time. You're in my company, in my building. You go to the bathroom, I got a camera there. And it's all good, 
Okay, it does, doesn't matter. They just had a report, um, and this is from Japan. And the Asian culture is very different when it comes to work, all right, and how they work. And at this point right now, Japan is the most overworked employee in the world, okay? Japanese folks will stay in the office as long as the boss is there, some of them will stay because the, it, the rules are, if the boss is here, I need to be here. 11 o'clock, midnight, 1 o'clock, they're still at work. And if they just can't sit at the table, they just can't sit at the desk and just kind of do what they want. They have to be look, they have to look productive. So this guy, this one particular Japanese, he says, you know, I was I'm there till midnight, one o'clock sometimes, and I'm making copies of stuff I don't even need. I'm just making copies. I'm fixing the desk, I'm doing all this stuff. And I'm like, okay, so what time you gotta come back in? I gotta be back in at 7 a.m. in the morning. And like, doesn't that, you know, isn't that kind of skirting some labor laws or something? No, not in Japan. Japan, you work for the company, the boss is here late, you're here late too. Right? That's just the way it goes. So now you have the boss's personal life kind of seeping into your life, right? What if the boss doesn't want to go home? Right? I've had bosses like that. They don't want to go home. They at seven, eight o'clock at night. Hey, sir, I gotta go. I don't know about you, but I like to be home. You may not want to go home. That's on you, but I can't stick around here, right? And that should not affect my performance evaluations or anything like that, right? But it does, all right? And then in the day, not here, but you know, elsewhere, right? So it really is about perspective and in, in the context of where you're at and what the norms are in those particular areas. Oops, excuse me. I'm trying to get through. Okay, so this is the uh, last key point I'm going to make here. Um, reasonable expectation of privacy, right? If the employee has noticed, then there truly is no real expectation of privacy. The company is allowed to monitor even when it promises not to monitor, right? And then this goes to the whole point of you accepting and acknowledging the fact that the company has the right to monitor you, okay? You can't go and turn around and say, I don't want you watching me. It's not right, whatever the case may be, because inherently, when you sign that contract, you have given up your rights to privacy, okay? And this is where the company really kind of, you know, uh, has a, a, a ground to stand on when it comes to privacy and making sure that they're monitoring people, but it has to be in a discreet way, it has to be in a way that's in the interest of the company and what you're doing. Now, it just can't be frivolous where you're just watching the person because, all right, because we got some creepy people out here, all right, and people have watched people just because, right, they're infatuated with them, right? We had uh, managers watching employees because they want, they, they want to go out with them or they're trying to see what they're doing and that kind of thing, right? So unethical use of the monitoring uh, system, but again, they're well within their rights. If you're inside the building, you have to be careful about who you give the power to, right? And who's who's controlling all this particular monitoring systems and and um in the in the privacy of those people that work for you, and and making sure that people don't take advantage of those things because once they take advantage of it, you're liable as a company, right? You're exposed. But again, it's a very hard thing to prove to say this person was focusing on me and not necessarily monitoring me for work-related purposes, right? Because they're probably gonna monitor you while you're working. So they're like, well, I just monitor her because I was working. Well, you can't monitor her for seven hours, right? Or five hours. Like you gotta, you know, spread the wealth, okay? You can't, you just can't stick to that particular person, right? And so if the company makes it clear that they're monitoring you, right? And you agree to that, that's it, right? There's no real leg to stand on as far as like, oh, I'm not going to, you know, I'm, I'm going to sue or that kind of thing, right? Most nowadays, it's really difficult to escape a camera, okay? Doesn't matter where you're at. You're on the street, you're in your car, 
you're in the classroom, you know, I, when I teach at SDSU or, you know, City College, they have cameras in the classroom. And I started my last school, we had, we had cameras in the classroom, right? Because the school, in, for insurance purposes, they needed to monitor what was going on in the classroom, right? And it's smart because if you have a, you know, an issue, it's good to be able to rely on the recordings, right? And if you're not doing anything as a professor and you're running the class properly, then no big deal, right? Um, sometimes you get taken advantage of because there's certain things that the institution doesn't want you teaching or talking about. And so they'll monitor that, that and then they'll bring you in and say, look, we don't want you talking about this because it doesn't align with the school core values or whatever it is they be, right? That's a whole other issue about uh, educational freedom and dogma and stuff like that with professors deal with, right? But the way they sometimes monitor you, they'll come in and they'll look at, you know, what you're teaching and they're like, we don't want you teaching that because, again, it doesn't line up with what we want the students to get out of the school, okay? All right. Any questions, comments, complaints? You guys are going to get to roll early today because Dr. Cage is moving and I don't want my furniture to disappear. Before 10, okay? So, oh, I got that on recording too. They're going to come good. <laughs> Dang it. All right. Um, get your LE in, um, case study this week. Get that in, okay? And uh, that should be it. And I'll see you next week. Got any questions about the case study? Email me, okay? Okay. Just make it good. Just make it good. Just make it good. Okay. I think we were already down like four. Yeah. People start working around right now. I'll be done by Friday afternoon. I'll send back to you. As long as you submit it. Yeah. Oh, great. Somehow I need to turn off. Oh, yeah.